Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Mike Cahill. Mike has worked for the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources Division of Animal Health for 22 years, and he has been the director of the division for the last nine years. Mike, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Stacy. I'm happy to be here. So I just was wondering if you could tell us how you got started in the business. Well, I graduated from UMass Boston with a degree in biology, and while I was still in school, I think I'd always fantasized about going to Africa and studying lions. Uh, I've always been a big fan of big cats. In, in all fairness, maybe this is the place to admit it. I'm more of a cat person than a dog person. <laughs> you can go right ahead um, and admit that. <laughs> <laughs> As I got towards the end of my school, I wound up spending a lot of time in lab settings. And uh, after graduation, my first job, I actually worked for the Department of Public Health. I drove around on the South Shore, South Coast, and Cape Cod trapping mosquitoes and bringing them back to the lab and testing them for eastern equine encephalitis. Of course, that, because mosquitoes are only around during the summer, that job dried up towards the end of the fall. And uh, it just so happened that across the hall from the mosquito lab was the rabies lab. And that was back in 1993 when rabies had first moved into the state. And the guys at the rabies lab always had the best stories, man. There was some crazy stuff going on with animals. So I got to know them pretty well. And, and as the mosquito season dried up, they were getting busier and busier. So they were looking to hire. And uh, at the same time, there was a job posted at the Department of Agriculture for a rabies program coordinator. So I actually applied and got both jobs. But rather than being stuck over at the lab, I chose the job with the Department of Agriculture, which is more of a sort of a liaison. I, I coordinated with veterinarians and town officials and owners as well, just to get everyone up to speed on uh, the rabies laws and and the protocols we have for quarantines for animals that are possibly exposed. And I, I did that for a number of years. As I was here, I was asked by my bosses to help out in this parvo outbreak situation or this distemper outbreak situation. And other diseases started to creep into my repertoire. And at one point when uh, my boss had decided he was ready to move on, he had made the suggestion to the commissioner that I might make a good director for the division. And uh, they offered me that. And that's where I've been ever since. Wow. So you've sort of been in the in the same department for well, for the 22 years. And so you started in 94 and I sort of walked down memory lane a bit here, too. So I started with MRFRS in uh, the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society in 1994 also. And it was in the late 90s, I think, that we were able to get to know one another in the rabies role. So I think let's talk a little bit about your time working as the director of that division. In Massachusetts, we have a wound of unknown origin rule for cats that they have to stay quarantined for six months. Is that correct? And But now it has changed. So you can talk about that, too. Correct. So, yeah, that has changed. Our concern is we Massachusetts is now a rabies endemic state, meaning unlike an, an epidemic where a disease might wash through an area, we know that it, it exists in a fairly regular frequency among the wild animal population. And for that reason, we have to continue to be concerned about domestic animals that are possibly exposed to raccoons or foxes or skunks or some of the other wildlife species that, that uh, transmit the disease. So in addition to those situations where we're aware that a raccoon or a skunk has fought with, say, a dog or a cat, we're equally concerned with certainly free-roaming cats that may just come home with wound, bite wounds on them. We don't know what they fought with. Our concern is that that may have been an encounter with a rabid animal. So those are treated as possible exposures. The good news is uh, a, a, for you know a stray cat or a feral cat who previously had been you know, had no known vaccination history, if they had an exposure like that, they would have to have been quarantined for six months. Um, we've recently updated the rabies regulations based on changes to the national recommendations from the uh, National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians. They've 
done enough research to understand that the vac- rabies vaccines are far more effective than we thought they had been. And also that uh, we've got a pretty good understanding of really what the longest time frame a dog or cat could incubate the rabies virus before showing signs. So for an animal that's never been vaccinated, they do still have to do a relatively lengthy quarantine, but it's only four months now instead of six months, which ideally is a, a little bit less intrusive. But what's what's even better is if we have some proof that the animal had received a rabies vaccine at some point in the past, they can get a booster shot immediately and they only have to do a 45-day quarantine. Uh, and up until recently, even if an animal had been vaccinated multiple times in the past, if they were not considered currently vaccinated at the time of the exposure, they'd still get stuck doing that six-month quarantine. But at this point now that we know enough about if you've had vaccine in your system before, you get a booster shot, you get a pretty good response from your immune system. And we do believe that virtually any animal that's get received that booster shot is going to have enough protection to prevent disease. So with regards to identification, with regards to a community cat, if the cat is ear tipped, that is enough information to prove that it has been rabies vaccinated or is that not enough information? Well, that's a little tricky. The ear tip, obviously, we know it's been spayed or neutered, but technically for what we would consider proof of prior vaccination, it really should be a vaccination certificate. So ideally, in in some of these community cat situations, we would be still suggesting to try and do microchips because there's an, you can save enough information in there that we could trace back to the veterinarian who had administered the vaccine and, and acquire proof that it was done. Um, you don't necessarily have that same traceability with an ear tip. So it, it, we, do, we would think it would be beneficial to continue to, you know, so we're still promoting that they use um, microchips, yeah, for, microchips for that yeah. type of information. And if someone is letting their own cat out, it is highly recommended for every well for any cat to be microchipped to be helpful for for this kind of situation or for other situations. You actually in our pre-show conversation had mentioned a scenario about community cats in um, North Adams where there was a cat that had multiple owners. Well, yeah, we had been alerted to a situation based on the rabies positive cat that was found in a neighborhood. And when we communicated with the animal control officer, uh, we were told that she had some significant concern because this was a neighborhood where there were numerous free roaming cats. And when she, you know, at first it was an estimate from anywhere to 50 to 100 cats that were sort of just roaming around this neighborhood. I think when we got out there and really, you know, took inventory, it was probably more like about 40 cats. But What was funny in the process of doing the inventory, we needed to communicate with people that lived in the neighborhood. And in some cases, we would show somebody a a picture of this cat. You know, is this your cat? Yes. And in fact, we would have, in some cases, cats that were claimed to be owned by several different people. And in one case, we had one cat that had four uh, alleged owners, or at least four people that were offering him food. He was probably one of the better fed cats in the neighborhood. <laughs> so in cases like that, obviously, you know, microchipping is a great way to identify those animals and for the owner to ensure that they've got a claim in the ownership of, unfortunately, in Massachusetts, what's still deemed to be property. I was just wondering, what, what were your greatest challenges in, in dealing with community cats over the last, you know, 10 to 20 years? Well, it's, I I think probably when we met may have been one of the most challenging situations, not having anything to do with the fact that it was meeting you, of course, (laughs) but uh, we had had almost a very similar situation to the one I just described in North Adams. There was actually a managed feral cat colony that, um, I'm trying to remember the exact scenario, that there was either a raccoon that was feeding with them or had just been found sort of in the middle of their territory. Uh, which was subsequently tested and came back positive for rabies. So we had a significant concern about a number of the animals in the managed colony having been possibly exposed, for which, given their vaccination status and the the rules at the time, would have required a a six-month quarantine. And I know in a lot of cases that we had dealt with, you know, even before that and subsequent to then, you know, the, even the managers of the colony said, well, there's no way we can handle this. And, and a number of cats wound up being euthanized because they couldn't be quarantined anywhere. And when, when it was sort of a pleasure to have worked with you who had the resources and, and the passion to actually set up a, I think it was, it was at somebody's house, was it not? That yep, you yep. 
built something built something in the basement, sort of a large cage system that uh, the animals could, could be kept in for that quarantine, and therefore they did not have to be put down. I, I was appreciative of that just because when we have to advise somebody that their options are quarantine or euthanasia, and we know they don't really have the means to do a quarantine, it's that's really the worst part of the job. So it was a it was a blessing to have been able to work with someone that was going to expend the resources necessary to to avoid that. And it was a big challenge. I mean, for our organization, that whole year was really focused around this group of about 30 cats. Many of them were kittens. And so by the time they hit their six month point, we had really lobbied aggressively. And when they, you know, hit their release date, you know, there were people lining up to adopt those cats. So it was, um, you know, it was great that by the end of their time, it wasn't like they stayed at the shelter or they stayed in the foster situation. They were able to to move on to families very quickly, and they were easy to socialize cats. Um, they were all definitely newly abandoned cats, so they weren't many, um, you know, hardcore feral cats. I would say in that in that group of cats that we had. So those were sort of the upshot, you know, scenario for us. But it was a, a huge amount of resources and. Not many groups can say that they can do that. But at that point in time, if you had asked me two weeks before the this, this situation happened, if we would have been able to do that, I would have said no, too. So you just sort of take what's given to you and try and figure out a way to make it work. And we did go back and forth and try to negotiate you know, a situation that would work well, you know, ensuring that everybody who was around the cats had their pre-exposure to rabies vaccinations. And um, we had pretty strict protocol about uh, who had those vaccines and really encouraging all of our volunteers to get those vaccines. Um, you know, if you're handling cats that, that you don't know where they've been, you know, getting those vaccines is very helpful. But yeah, it was, it was a great way to get to know you and we were able to continue to work together over the years. But uh, it was definitely a challenge and, and definitely one of my greatest challenges too. You bring up an important point there though, is that, you know, I, I greatly appreciate the, the people that are out there doing this work, but we want to make sure that they remain healthy so they can continue the work. So it, it is something that they should take into consideration. And getting the pre-exposure shots is a lot easier and less expensive than receiving the post-exposure shots. If, if you're not protected up front and you have an exposure, then uh, that's a sort of a, a little bit more invasive and, and expensive treatment. So it's definitely advised of anyone that's handling cats out there that we don't have medical histories on. My understanding, too, is the um, health insurance industry 15 years ago may not have covered pre-exposure, but uh, I believe they are starting to cover it. And if you advocate hard enough, you should be able to get coverage. But obviously, each each policy is different and has its own rules and regulations. So you'd have to check with your own provider. But, um, you know, if you say that you are actively volunteering at an organization or obviously if you're working for an organization, you should really strongly advocate for, for that protection. Right. And I think anyone for anyone doing trapping, because you may catch something that isn't a cat, that's uh, that can be become very important because you're you are leaving yourself a little bit vulnerable in those situations. There's the CDC has specific recommendations that sometimes if you pass that along to your physician, you can have a better time with it. Uh, there's also specific recommendations that come from the Department of Public Health, certainly for animal control officers, but I think they would probably be happy to provide a, a similar letter for anyone that was actively out there, you know, trapping and handling cats with unknown medical histories. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Ready to make a big difference for cats in your community? We've got an exciting opportunity that can jumpstart your efforts. The Community Cats Podcast has launched Community Cats Grants. When you qualify for this innovative program, you'll gain valuable knowledge about how to raise funds for your spay-neuter efforts. Plus, we'll match the funds you raise up to $1,000, doubling your ability to make a difference for cats. Fundraising doesn't have to be scary. We'll be with you every step of the way. Check it out. You can find all of the details on the Community Cats podcast website under our education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. So, Mike, I'm going to sort of turn to a bit of a big picture question for you. Being in Massachusetts over the last 20 plus years and what you've seen going on with regards to helping community cats over the last 20 years and then looking forward, how do you see things changing for free-roaming cats in Massachusetts? 
uh, just to sort of preface that the thing I'm not seeing changing is the laws within the Commonwealth. And you're probably uh, as aware of it as anyone that there's very little mention of cats in the state laws. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, statutes related to the keeping of dogs and the licensing of dogs and, and things like that. But cats really only fall in in a couple of small places, one of which being rabies vaccinations and the other is you know, emergency care provided by veterinarians if a cat is found, say, hit by a car in the middle of the road. Other than that, there's very little that's required. And I, I think one of the things we've been encouraging is that municipalities sort of, if not in, encourage or require, at least allow their animal control officers to start dealing with some situations involving cats. And some communities have really gone above and beyond and done a great job and and you've got you know the animal control officer and actively picking up strays and and having an adoption program and everything but some other communities literally I, you know I've been told I can't handle cats so I think that's something that that we've constantly tried to work on and it's something we'll need to continue working on one thing one tool that recently came into our toolbox which has been incredibly helpful in that area is the what we refer to as the Mass Animal Fund. The, it began in 2012, referred to as the Homeless Animal Prevention and Care Fund. And what it is is a uh, trust account established under the department that is able to receive donations. Primarily, we get them through a tax checkoff on the Massachusetts state income tax form. But we also were able to set up on our webpage sort of a donate now button and, and we can accept, you know, credit card donations and that kind of stuff. So we're trying to continue to expand our, our uh, funding sources for that program. Uh, right now, we get about, on average, I would say $250,000 a year. And that money is used for basically two major things. One, we are to establish a training program for Massachusetts animal control officers. And the other main part of it is to establish a spay, neuter, and vaccination program for unowned cats. So those would be ones that were basically in the control of animal control officers. Also da dogs and cats that were uh, are owned by low-income residents. And we've also carved out a percentage of that to be used for feral TNR programs when that money's available. So we're really looking to, part of the effort was to sort of do a blitz and, and get as much of that money out there and get as many animals as fixed as possible, uh, certainly in the free roaming and uh, stray and feral cat populations, so that if you can sort of knock down a number of the breeding animals, then ideally you have some breathing space to deal with the, the ones that are in between. So we've been really happy with, with uh, our response to that program. It's something we're still building. Uh, we have about 25 veterinary providers that accept vouchers for free spray neuter surgeries. And we reimburse the veterinarians directly that are, that are signed up with us with the program. Yeah, it's a phenomenal program. I'm, I, I was so happy when it um, came about. Uh, it was just, as you said, it's another another piece to the toolkit, but yet it involves direct involvement by animal control, and it's really forcing animal control to become aware of cats and communicats, uh, teaching them about TNR, and um, hoping you know that maybe some of them may attend you know, our Sunday spay and neuter clinics and, and that kind of thing, just to bring them more into the awareness of some of the projects that we've been working on over all these years. Yeah, I, I won't be shy about having been very calculated that we insist that the animal control officer be not just a part of the process, but in the middle of the process. We want to make sure that they're learning from the people that are in the community doing the volunteering, do the trapping, because they're already out there. And if they're not working together or they don't know each other, or in some cases I know they have there's an adversarial role between them, we we need to bring those people together. I mean, certainly when you talk about stepping back and looking at the bigger picture, everyone needs to recognize that we're, we should all be working towards the same goal, which is making animals' lives better. And those guys are as much a part of it as the, as the trappers and any other volunteer. Obviously, they come from a different place, but when we can find issues where 
they can work together. And, and in some cases, finally, some of the volunteer groups are getting, you know, an actual financial benefit from the animal control officer. I mean, that's, we need to generate that goodwill where we can. And I think it's an important step in broadening even their ability to handle certain situations is to be able to network with the the other group of volunteers that are operating in their community already. I want to touch upon, uh, you talked about the volunteers and the small grassroots organizations um, working in the communities. How do you communicate with those groups? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that we communicate directly with them at all. And that was Part of what we were planning to do with this spay neuter voucher program was to get them communicating at least with the local officials. There's also, you know, I mean, be, so beyond that, there's certainly since launching the spay neuter program, I think the folks that are working on that program, Lauren Gilfeather and Cherry Gustafson, have been more involved in some of the regional community cat groups. And, and beyond that, I'm uh, I frequently hanging around on mass cats, so I, I do communicate with some of them through that. But in general, you know, there's not necessarily a lot of direct communication unless, you know, someone runs into a situation where, you know, they might want to tap into what we set aside as, a, as an emergency fund within the spay neuter voucher program. So if we had like, you know, like a hoarding situation or, or like that rabies situation in, in North Adams, we can try and concentrate a number of funds in one small area and try and get um, a situation resolved or at least to a more um, handleable level. Mike, I can't believe it, but we're coming close on time here. I was just wondering, if, uh, how can people find you or find out more about the Mass Animal Fund? You could start by going to our website, which is uh, www.massmass.gov, G-O-V, and then forward slash A-G-R, as in agriculture. Under the Division of Animal Health, you'll see all my contact information. And certainly, if people are interested to learn more about the Mass Animal Fund or have an interest in donating to the Mass Animal Fund, you can just go to massanimalfund.com. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? As I was alluding to just now, I, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done over the last two decades and all of the other volunteers and trappers and everyone else that, that's out there that's trying to improve the lives of cats. That is something that we are also passionate about. We don't always get the same leeway that uh, that some of the nonprofits can do, but we certainly support all those efforts and we recognize that uh, without all of those efforts, we the cats would not be in the position they're in now, and we hope to continue to work together to improve that. Mike, I want to thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Thanks, Stacy. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 